In just the last 24 hours, we've heard horrific news coming in of 20 Indian soldiers at least dying in the Ladakh region along the Galwan Valley. And so just to speak about the consequences of that, the road forward with me now, retired Lieutenant General H. Spanag, who used to be in charge of the entire area as GOC of that area. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us, the Hindustan Times, to just explain to us and give us perspective and understanding about what exactly is happening with China. I wanted to start by asking you, just before this interview, just as the interview is starting, sir, we've had China uh, give its statement, the Foreign Ministry of uh, China speaking up, and they've basically said that we are, don't want any such clashes again. However, they are claiming Galwan Valley. Now, will you explain that to us? Because is it not right in assuming that that region, Galwan Valley, where this horrific incident took place on Monday, was previously undisputed? Up to five kilometers upstream, Galwan River, where the LAC runs, there was no dispute uh, prior to this incident. However, right from the beginning of this uh, uh, development of this current situation when it was uh, it has been uh, in the news that they have uh, intruded two to three kilometers inside our territory and as per my military assessment they also secured the heights to the north and to the south they have been telling our uh, uh, senior officers who have been negotiating that galwan valley belongs to them and they it is it and they have had sovereignty over it for, for years. You talk about political reading, but your articles also talk about the fact that you say that by denying that they were inside our territory, ever since, you know, we've had, we knew that we we're talking about the clashes that was acknowledged. Uh, our, you know, all newspapers reported that, all media reported that. But the government, you say by uh, not acknowledging that they were in our territory, that was also a mistake. Why do you say that? I say it because of this reason that one, China uh, always exploits a prevailing narrative that uh, is, is there in, a, in, a, in its adversary, you know, as far as adversary is concerned. For example, with, in respect of USA, they exploit racism. Now, in India, the narrative is that we have a strong government which has given freedom to the um, uh, army, um, the, the armed forces. We are upgrading our armed forces, we are upgrading our border infrastructure, and we will take aggressive action. And all our lost territories, be the POK, be the Baltistan, be taxation, we are going to recover uh, sooner or later. And our parliament resolutions are there and we go by them. So this is the kind of narrative which we have built. And this is the kind of, uh, kind of uh, image the government, uh, the government has, has. Now, when these clashes happened, and because of our poor reading of the situation, we failed to read the Chinese strategic intent. We failed to see that they had not come in like they did in Depsang and here. This time they mean business and they are going to, they are, they, they are going to, they are looking for a skirmish and they may trigger or engineer a, 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 a skirmish or a border incident. Uh, we went into denial on the issue of uh, that there is a different perception in the area. The fact is, there was no differing perception in Galwan. There was no differing perception at Hot Springs, Gogra Post, and Konkala. Yes, this place, it was different. And here the perception was they wanted up to finger four, and we wanted to go up to, we used to control up to finger eight. But now they prevented us from doing that. And we kept on saying there is no intrusion. They have not occupied any, of any, any territory. So what, was, what were we trying to do? The Chinese said, well, we have done nothing. We have only come up to where, uh, you know, which is our area. And you are saying the same thing, that there's no intrusion. So what's the hullabaloo about? So we played into the Chinese hands. I see. Yet, on the, yet on the ground, so this was for public perception. This was for public perception. On the ground, we made another cardinal mistake. We treated this incident not from the military point of view, that this is a proper military operation, a proper military intrusion, we kept trying to handle it like a border incident. Like what we saw at Depsang, both sides facing each other, then one side goes back, and we thought we'd get into negotiations, and the same, we were lulled into complacency by the previous incidents, and we thought they'll go back. Whereas, as early as 28th of May, in my article, I pointed out 
that we are misreading the situation. The Chinese have come with a very clear strategic intent. They want to sever the uh, DBO sector by coming into the Galwan River. They want to lay their claims, prevent the uh, uh, sort of development of a border infrastructure, and influence our foreign policy. And so this, we, 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 we did not appreciate it. Consequently, our approach was like policing the border. That's why the troops were not carrying arms. When, when for example, the, the clash that took place day before yesterday night, the troops were unarmed. But can you explain that to us? I wanted to ask you about that, sir. Is that normal? Because for all of us hearing it, soldiers, why should soldiers be not carrying arms? Why is it that they were using sticks and stones and the thought of death or to our soldiers by a beating is, is quite horrific? Because we are earlier handling of border incidents was that both sides used to face each other and because of they were facing each other, we didn't want a, a kind of a, a escalation of the situation. So both sides would not use their arms. At times you have seen soldiers putting hands in their pockets and talking to you know, the adversaries. Yes. But sooner or later, when armies confront each other, they first got into jostling, pushing with shoulders. Then they got into um, more scuffles. And then as the, as the temperatures went up, and by design, by design by the Chinese, when it happened on 5th, 6th May, they claimed with clubs, they came with, uh, with uh, um, you know, knuckle dusters, they came with the studded uh, baseball bats. And they, it was to, it, it was in fact at the local level exert their, exert their uh, supremacy on us, and also to 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 what, what should I say to to humiliate us, and we fell into the trap. So, sir, Military. what would have been different? What would have been different if mid-May, when this started, when they first came into our territory? In mid-May, if the government would have said, yes, they've come in there and we're tackling it, what would have been different? Yes. Firstly, the public would, have been, would not have been shocked as, as the public has been shocked by the day before yesterday's incident. Because everybody would have been prepared that there's a developing situation. But before that, we committed another mistake. We were surprised both at the strategic level, the raw failed to report that the Chinese regular troops have moved from an exercise that are moving forward. It's not only here, they moved, they carried out precautionary deployment all along the LAC, from here to Sikkim and to, to, the, to, the, to the Northeast. We did not get the strategic signal. That would have clearly told them that they have come to mean, mean business. Secondly, at the tactical level, we were surprised. If Chinese preempted us and occupied these areas, so did we have the option. We could have also secured the heights to the north of uh, uh, Finger 4 to Finger 8 in advance. We could have also gone and occupied the heights on Galwan River. So we misread the situation and we were surprised. So now had, 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 if, if this situation was there, then the troops would have been armed. Even if there were clashes, the troops could have defended themselves. Here we have the horrendous situation where the commanding officer of a unit has been clubbed to death. It, it, Indian Army has never faced this kind of humiliation ever. In, in this entire uh, this thing, 200 and plus years of history, where unarmed troops have been clobbered in, in this manner. This is plain and simple murder. The troops would not have gone unarmed without a clear order from the Plit our army hierarchy. That means the troops were given specific orders that you will not uh, take any violent action, you will not trigger any incident, we don't want a hot war, you will remain unarmed so that the situation will escalate. And before the hierarchy gave this direction, there would definitely have been political clearance. Because militaries do not roam around like this. When army fires, it fires for effect. When it confronts an adversary, the adversary is threatening us, we fire. And that is why you will recall, Sunitra, I did this uh, 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 interview with you after the major Gugai's incident. And one of the reasons why I criticized that incident very much was that military can should never take non-military actions. It fires for effect. Yes. This is the reason. And this, I think, is a big failure, both at the political level as well as at the military level. Finally, I want to ask you, as someone who's not just a soldier, sir, but as a strategist as well, what is the way forward? 
how do we fix this? Now that this incident has happened, and it has happened because of various reasons I have explained that. You know, and the principal reason was that we treated it as a border incident and not as a as a as a proper military operation launched by China. Okay, that is a fundamental error. An incident has taken place and a great loss of life has taken place. I think the worst ever loss in this manner of unarmed troops ever. And probably in recent history of the world, nothing like this has happened in military history of the world. Having said that, we should not get emotionally carried away by this incident. We are hard-nosed people at the level at which we all operate, you know, at the strategic level, the government operates. And, and like when I was used in the Northern Command, I was operating, you don't get carried away by emotions. Yes, loss is there, but we must have a very clear head, clear head when we start looking at the future. So one is don't think about it. We have fundamentally two options. One is that when such an incident takes place, uh, even the Chinese will be disturbed about it. While we may say they triggered it, it, is, it affects their international image. The sheer brutality of the incident and the way it has happened, it also affects their international image. They also do not want a war as such. Okay. And uh, this, is, this is a general assumption that most, most at political level, if you can achieve your objectives without war, you will not want a war. Now, there can be a, uh, because of this incident, and because of the publicity it gets, and because of the anger in India, and because of the, uh, if China foresees that a war will be bad for itself also, for its own international image, it may create a ground for diplomatic negotiation. What is our political aim today? Our political aim today should be that status quo anti April 2020 has to be restored at all costs. Number two, at the end of this entire the thing that has happened on the LSE, we should demarcate the, demarcate the uh, LSE so that such incidents don't get repeated. So diplomatically, if we engage, I want to take your mind back to the Konkala incident. Up to 59, we were following a forward policy. And at Konkala, what happened? That one fine day when the, both the sides came uh, you know, confronting each other, uh, there was a, a police party of CRPF which was ambushed at Konkala. Ironically, at Konkala, and the same spot where one of the intrusions. Wow! Taken. And uh, there, nine uh, Jawans were killed, three taken prisoner of war, and uh, sorry, three three wounded, and seven taken prisoner of war. Immediately after that incident, Chauin Lai offered negotiations and to settle wherever we are that we should settle up wherever we are and we, we uh, that you, you be here and in the Northeast, McMahon line uh, will, will prevail. But uh, Prime Minister Nehru disagreed and he said, no, we will not negotiate, whole of Aksai Chin is out. My point is that Aksai Chin was beyond our reach. We were militarily very weak. We were focusing on our economy. So Mr. Modi is in something like a similar situation. While we are not, we are not an army of 1962, we have improved a lot. But China has improved much more. There is a distinct technological asymmetry between the two armies. And China has a clear edge over us. Secondly, we have not invested into our army for the last 20 years, which includes seven years of, 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 of the present government being in power. Our focus is on economy. So there is a asymmetry. It doesn't mean we are weak. It doesn't mean we can't fight. We can. Right? So now uh, uh, you have to, the first, that's why I said the first option is open up negotiations and put this incident behind, but get ready, get ready for the worst. And if negotiations fail at your own time, we have got time on our side. We need not rush into things. There is no need to take, no need to take action that we tend to take towards Pakistan. Even they are wrong because you must act at the time and place of own choosing. You don't go about retaliating immediately after something has happened. So that is that is that's a rush of blood. You, you will make you will make mistakes. So don't do anything as yet, but prepare. Get your get mobilized. Put your people in place, 
and at your own time you can decide if you want to take military action if diplomacy fails now militarily yes we have got fair number of options we can also do so many things which i don't want to talk about for obvious reasons and our military aim should be to to restore status quo and at the end of it get the lac demarcated even the military aim i'm talking about and uh, and this should be achieved with minimum loss of territory elsewhere so that in final negotiations we talk from a position of strength that means we gain something we we take necessary action to restore status quo and in the bargain if we have a loss elsewhere we shouldn't get perturbed about it overall we should be prepared for the final negotiations because ultimate aim of every war is peace and that should be our aim so for the moment we should not rush into uh, taking any strategic decision tread carefully time we have the time with us we should not get caught in the situation uh, that we got caught in 1962 general panag it's always so enlightening to hear from you thank you so much for speaking to us well a uh, pleasure to be with you later once again thank you sir thank you